that's uh, popular. So I did some roughs for that and they loved them. But the guy said, it looks like a golf divot. And <laughs> We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, but they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. So as time went on, I became... Uh very involved with the peace movement, uh, CND. I went on the Order Master marches in the mid 60s. So a real strong social con conscience, I reckon. And I met uh, someone who became my wife. Um, we were both 17. I left school halfway through A-levels and I left home, much particularly my mother's disgust, was upset. And we moved into Southampton, into a bed sit and then we went around doing freelance murals. I thought, I've got to follow the dream. If it leads nowhere, I've still got to do it. I'm not going to end up with a gold watch after 50 years. It's not what I can do. Um, I just couldn't bear it. So that's what we did. And we, we did quite a few of these, student union bars, that sort of thing. Um, we even took a portfolio up to Beckenham, where Sue's brother lived. And he used to go to a pub called The Three Tons, and which was an arts lab. And he'd do acoustic duets with another guy called David Jones, who in fact became David Bowie. So we met him and showed him the folder. Uh, he was getting ready for a gig, so he didn't really want a wall in his house painted, but it was a chance to get to meet him and Tony Sconti anyway. That was my first job as I finished art school in Brighton. And it was an airbrushed uh, cover. I got 150, I think, for that one. Not bad for 1956 or 1976. And um, yeah, I, I had to get hold of an airbrush, but without a compressor, I managed to get a tire blown up to 40 <laughs> PSI and a, a attached it, soldered a lead. I managed to get it sorted somewhere. It's all done with gouache. I, I bought the Tamiya model of the bike and drew from that. Um, that really didn't go an awful lot further. We moved back to Southampton and I was going around all the pubs with a folder on my back tied on with a 12 foot scarf on a bicycle saying, I'll draw you a pub for 150 quid. And they laughed at me, but I will do you a limited edition of signed prints, which you can sell. We'll split the difference. Ah, so a deal was done. I did quite a number of those. And it was during that time that we moved back there that I bumped into Nick Lambert in on the street you know, a little one-year-old. And he mentioned that uh, he, they were making games on cassette tapes, duplicating them. And they had been putting photocopy covers into them and they wanted to go really professional and do full color. And so he, uh, he asked if I would like to do one, the, the chess player, which I'll come on to in a minute. But that led to an awful lot of work with Quicksilver, which helped get me on the road, if you like. I suppose he might have sent a sense of gratitude because four years earlier, some friends of his came round to us. You know, we were living the hippie dream. And they said, Nick's in Winchester prison and they won't let him out without £50 surety and bail. You're the only people we know who are married and got a flat. So uh, they would accept that. So off we went in a Morris Thousand up to Winchester prison and I bailed him out 50 quid. I said, don't dare have scone because I haven't got the money. <laughs> and he said, no, he wouldn't. And, uh, I, th I think he did some time actually, but when it came to court. But he remembered that, which is nice. <laughs> and this is the story of my first cover with them. It's basically get your sketchbook out and draw some ideas. Be prepared to completely throw them away because often they're rubbish, but you can do that. It's, it's not like you're sacrificing hours of work in a finished piece that they don't like. You're just getting it out of the way. So that's developing the character. And, you know, this is important part for me, really important is to get, to get this done. And there's all the notes on the side with things I've got to buy and bills I've got to chase. 
And these are the chess pieces that appear on the front cover, which is easy in 3D software. Now you just scale them, do the size you want, bang, it's done. Those all had to be drawn to scale in different sizes and with the correct perspective. That is pretty close to what ended up as the original. And there you are. Uh, sadly, Nick Lambert refused to part with that one. He kept it because it was his who paid for it, which still angers me. <laughs> and the next one, non-Quicksilver, they went on to do was a thing called Wild West Hero. And uh, I was really buoyed by the fact that in a magazine, um, they said that this was the best current artwork on any game. Well, I'll buy that. Thanks very much. And that's how it ended up. A little whimsy-like character behind the cactus and hole in the shoe, try and give it some history. And then I got sort of a portfolio together somewhere and um, off with Quicksilver up to the halls where they sold a lot of their hardware and software. And I touted around to all the other people, book publishers, other games companies, and got into uh, Electronic Arts, you see, Melbourne House, um, eventually Cygnosis. Originally, I, I would hunt them out, I'd ring up, I'd go and visit, but then it, gradually they started to come to me, you know, which was pretty good. Um, there's Sentinel, that, that's Telecom Soft. Um, they like that, it's quite an icon, you know. If, the point is it's got to appear on a shelf full of other games and it's got a job to do. It's basically for someone to do that and read about it, it's job done then. So it's got to be some sort of icon, something really eye-catching. Um, that was a fun one with Electronic Arts. I'd got Goodyear all around there. In fact, you can still see, so on the website, you can still see some of the old tracing of Goodyear and they said we're not advertising Goodyear, change it to Electronic Arts. So I had to mask off that entire wheel, clean it all out with solvent cleaner and redraw it and respray it basically. They liked it in the end. That was uh, Risky Woods which was done at contemporary with the Nightmare stuff so a lot of the textures and ideas have sort of obviously leaked through. Um, that's Madden's football, Electronic Arts and they uh, they reckon there were four or five different covers of that that, that appeared, the software appeared on. And they said that was the one that outsold them all, which for me was lovely to hear. You know, you need encouragement because there's always plenty of discouragement. That was for Bullfrog EA, a uh, flood. And they wanted, they got the original artwork without any of this. And this was a puzzle for, for, for prizes. And so I had to mask off and clean now all of that with solvent again and add that you know rather than draw the whole thing again which they were okay with so you, so you can't you can't just spray over the top you want, every time you want to change it you have to clean yeah you want to you want to go back to the basic board maybe even a slight coat of white just to give it some lift behind yeah so yeah going over the top wouldn't be it, the, the the medium is um magic color acrylic inks which are solvable soluble until they dry and then they're really hard, you know, they're waterproof. You could pour water over a painting. So, uh, yeah, a, a lovely thing, lovely medium. Um, it's almost all exclusively that. I would, um, I would work in and scrape out highlights. These, for example, that was done with a, after I sprayed it, it was done with a, a, a typewriter rubber. You know, you get pencil versions of that and you just gently scrape back to get back partly to the board or completely to the board to get the highlights. Same with all of these areas there. How big are the originals? Uh, you, usually I did them about A2, um, which meant I had to buy the magic color in big bottles. And you can only get them in little droppers now. Um, yeah, so usually pretty big. Uh, that one was one of a whole set bought by Les Ed at, um, at Bullfrog. You know, I needed a bit of cash, so I went down with all the stuff that I'd done for them, about six, seven pieces, and he'd just sold the company to EA, so he'd arrived back in a brand new Range Rover that was still really smelling of the burnt paint inside the engine compartment, and he got his checkbook out and said, there you are, you know, it's all great mortgage paper, a few months, that's all right. That's... Uh, Popular, so I did some roughs for that, and they loved them. But 
the guy said, it looks like a golf divot. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the others disagreed and we went on and it, it, it sold, I, I remember they said at one count, it was like six million covers, uh, were printed on six million copies worldwide and it grew from there. Um, and the guy apologised, he said, I was all right, asked them, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, that's the first one I submitted, and um, they, they said it's isometric game, you know, so really we want that sort of view, so that's what they got, that was the final thing. I did all the logos as well for most games. So from that one, that was basically to completely start again? Oh yeah, it's just a new piece, yeah, yeah. I reckon it had to be done with three or four days. If it went over that, it tended to get overworked and I, I'd, I'd lose the spontaneity and the excitement and passion of doing it. Because you know, once I discovered this industry after the schooling I had had, it was bang, you know, I was on fire. I'm in the zone is the phrase that's popular, but you know, it's just, I lived and loved every moment of it. It just excited me the whole time. Was this an established technique you were using or were you developing new techniques? Oh, I developed it as I went, really, just oh, to get okay. what I needed and wanted. It wasn't something you'd learned as a, as a result of your, you know, your, your, your training, if you like. It was something you were no, no, the, the, new, new materials, new techniques. Yeah, the drawing was more, more basic, I, I suppose. The, the, the degree at Brighton Art School was more basic. You know, you a lot of life drawing. Mm -hmm. and before that, probably the, my best year was at Southampton doing foundation where for the first time ever I was exposed to printmaking, sculpture, life drawing, and I was in heaven, basically. It was just where I wanted to be and what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. And I would got out of that awful trap of 50 years in a gold watch. You know, it's, it wasn't for me. So I just thought I'd see where it would go. I don't, didn't know where it'd end up. But uh, I did get advice from my father and all said, make the most of it because when this goes really big, it'll be off to international ad agencies to do this sort of work. Yeah, I have a question. You said you did logos. So how did you do the fonts back? Did you design them by hand or did you have books or...? Not some, quite a lot of them by hand, really. It's, um, you know, they tend to be a bit extravagant and over the top, maybe. That, that one's obviously Times Roman. It's yeah. got to be if it's going to be in that sort of... Yeah, that, that was uh, interesting. I, I was, again, they called me. Joss Ellis invited me up to EA and we went into their, their room upstairs with all the coders working. It, it was a small unit in, next to Langley Station and they had a warehouse underneath with lorries would take out their goods to distribute and the coders were upstairs. But there was a locked off room with a keypad, a numeric lock, and Joss would said, staff aren't allowed in here. We went in and there it was, and it was really under wraps. So he showed it to me, all the mountains being built and knocked down. He said, there's a beta copy, take it home, come up with some ideas and send them back. So I did, and it went from there. So that was quite an interesting passage. So I've got a question. Yeah, sorry. Brief, what, uh, the, your client, how much did they, did they give you a large brief on what they wanted or were they, were they quite just going to do what they did? Yeah, that's interesting because David Gardner took over in charge of EA when they grew bigger and bigger. And I met him at E3. I said, do you remember me? He said, of course I do. You would go off and do whatever you like for artwork and we put it on the cover. But <laughs> they'd gone to a big ad agency next to, uh, next to Scotland Yard by then. So I, I went to see them and they said, well, do all that row of folders over there. So people would drop their samples off us to keep them. No, I can't forget it. <laughs> So yeah, um, that was a fun one. This is an original rough. It's uh, I, it was a fax. I had uh, I spent two grand on an A3 fax machine that could send half tone. So you got it wasn't that horrible chunky black and white. And I had to cut them down the middle to fit through the fax machine. <laughs> so I did that. Um, yeah, they 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 liked that. They said going the right way, but. Um, I really wanted to do that church spire. I saw some illustrations by Philippe Fix with this giant that strode through a barn and 
you could see all the construction of the barn as it was breaking and shattering. So I really felt like doing that church spire. But they said, well, it's trials of the Olympian gods. I'm sorry, but it's got to be, it's got to be Greek architecture. I said, well, that, you're right. It's, it's, it's your job. So yeah. I just flung that in there anyway. But um, that was Millennium Games. They wanted Robocod, so you know, Robocop was in on the cinema at the time. Um, that, that was interesting too, because they kept bringing out different versions of the fish. And I said, look, you, you choose one and stick to it, because this is really a not doing you any good. So they chose someone else. <laughs> That's... Um, that was a good one with Cygnosis. That's a, a colour rough. Sometimes I took it quite a bit further to, to really convince them. That's a, a rough that I faxed. The, the tryouts to get the excess paint off the brush they appear on a lot of the rough drawings. As they are working drawings, they're not meant to be put into an archive and enjoyed later. Did you paint that in oil? It looks a bit like oil. No. No, it's, it's definitely magic colour, and then I would use tubes of gouache or something to put little highlights on. But the main interest I had in this, you know, rather than fulfilling the brief, was I wanted to get this spatial toning right, you know, so you've got things way in the distance back there, and then bring forward. And yeah, I kind of worked. I was quite pleased with that one. That's not my logo, it's Roger Dean's. Another thing that surprised me, Roger Dean had done the cover artwork for version one and two of Shadow of the Beast. And I thought, and they're asking me to do three. Like it. Roger Dean is a Yes album illustrator, you know, one of the best. I thought perhaps he put his prices up, that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the finished one. That's, uh, again, one a bit of cheeky of me, that's a red kite because at the time there were only a small colony of them around Tregaran near where we lived in West Wales. And so I put a red kite in. This was a great job. With, uh, we called in by Cygnosis just before Christmas. Um, my wife did uh, all these chapter heads, which I think are lovely because she's better than me. And um, these are characters that are pit they wanted to festoon around the type in the book. You know, so they're, they're, this, this one's fun, for example, is a, a, a Scotsman. There was a, a Scots chapter. Uh, and he's using his sword to lift the kilt to see what's underneath, which is <laughs> always the perennial joke about Scottish people in kilts, isn't it? But there, you know, lots of little try it, scribble out, don't like that one, try the paint here. But we did that over Christmas. I had to turn the page, can you believe that? <laughs> <sighs> and there's more. You know, it, the, the intent was never to preserve these as, as sort of immaculate finished things. They were working, they were working drawings. And they had to take their place as such. That was uh, an advert they wanted for Lemming. So I, I really, really enjoyed doing that cover. It, it's basically someone playing the game and what happens to them is, is the mischief and mayhem they get up to. We've got uh, bungee jumpers, there's the crawler. Uh, diving into his mug of tea, smashing through the side and leaking it all out. Uh, the bombs, you know, you get bombs in there, don't you? And this one's um, tattooing Cygnosis on the back of the hand. <laughs> That's a bosun's chair where they're climbing up and embroidering lemmings in the side, plaiting the hair. You know, I just, and then cutting the cord to the keyboard. This one's for Atari. And I, I designed a triptych, so the middle section would be bursting out into the side, you know, again, to get some forward forceful impact. Um, yeah, that's quite, quite good fun. So I did, did four of those, and I went to see him another day at Everby Slav Station at the time, Atari. And he said, I'll show you an artwork. And it was a triptych, mainly green colours of a figure. He said, we had an artist do this for us. I said, OK, that's <laughs> fine in my design, though, but never mind. And he said, do you want, I don't know what we pay for it. I said, yeah, go on then. Nothing. He said he'd do it just to get his foot in the door. I said, well, I think you're an immoral <laughs> and, and I left. I never worked for him again because I think that's creepy. It's just yeah. not good enough. There. That's Bounces, which is for Beyond Software. I went, 
again, when I was trawling around looking for work, I went up to beat uh, Telecom Soft, uh, it's a guy called Francis Lee. He uh, had this game, and I, it was a Thursday afternoon, and I said, um, I boasted about how quickly I could turn artwork around. And he said, can you get the finished artwork to us by Tuesday morning? Okay. <laughs> so I went back, did that. I went to Smith's and got a picture of a book on boxing, and there was a guy being hammered against the ropes. So I used that for reference. And he got it by Red Star Tuesday morning. And his response was to send me a bottle of Verve Clico Champagne Direct. Thank you. And, and pay, of course. Uh, then he was working on it. I don't think the game ever came out. If it did, it was years later. Star Trek 21st anniversary. And I did that. It's, about, it's A1. It's a huge bit of art, but I still got it. And I had to go back and forth to Paramount on the transparency until they approved the likenesses and then they did in the end. But it didn't get used because it was years later so the other people had moved into the company and taken over the production. That's Dante's Inferno. I, I mentioned a few of you that who else had an Inferno? It can only be Dante's. I can't think of another one. But um, that's hybrid. I was looking at... Um, Geiger's work and sort of thinking, yeah, it's sort of kind of inspirational. This is the, the nightmare room painting technique where I, I spray the back of a shiny piece of paper and print it down because um, airbrush can look too sculpted ice cream, too soft. You know, it's, it's trying to introduce some texture and then airbrush and work out little details. Oh, and I went on to do more for him. He, he then left there because I, I think he'd kept a lot of invoices in a drawer and they, he wouldn't go to finance meetings and they decided he was a real liability, so they got rid of him. And he formed Starlight Software. And that's Infodroid. That one is Dogfight and then some game in the 20th century. I don't know which one. That's Neo Software Production. So I'm moving abroad now. I've got Austria coming to me for work here. <coughs> I met these, these two guys, they're really nice guys, very tall, Austrian, and we arranged to meet at a burger bar outside of uh, one of the CV, CMVG games or one of the annual games conventions. Arranged to meet at one, and I got there at seven minutes past and said, you're late. <laughs> That's Austrians and Germans for you. <laughs> but I was seven minutes late, but still. That was probably the last uh, game cover I did, that one. I quite liked that one. He recently bought this original off me, but yeah, I really was fond of that because, um, you know, you're looking at perspectives down a street through the image and uh, you know, there was a lot going on. And again, it's, um, it's another style, but it, it was appropriate to the brief and what was required by the company at the time. And so, you know, I, I would lend myself to any technique, really. That's Fighting Falcon, is it? No. Sky Chase. That's for Mirasoft. Um, again, I, I would work from models. I'd build that model and then work out which angle to do it. Uh, Steiner Lund, who I know is an illustrator, he would go to the Ministry of Defence and get photographs. But, you know, I wanted to be in control of the perspective and the angle, thank you. So that's the way I did it. That's Speedball 1, that's uh, Imageworks, uh, Mirasoft organised that, someone called John Cook. So I did the logos as well. Dark Castle, another one. It's got the date on there, 1988, I think. But again, it's lending itself to the work I was doing with Nightmare, so there was quite a lot of cross-fusion going on. This is uh, Electric Dreams, Spin Dizzy. That, that proved quite a popular cover. A lot of people said, you know, we want a game cover. Can you do something like this? So, Chameleon, that's um, Earth, Water, Fire and Air, and Death Wake. That's one of the only ones I ever did that had the logo actually embodied in the artwork because, you, you, you know, you need to keep it separate because of positioning use it on the spine and so on, and uh, much better to leave the space for it to happen. But as all these were over printing it, probably best done that way. 
This one's an important piece. I was delivering that to Paula Byrne at uh, Melbourne House in Richmond, and she said, oh, we've had someone on the phone, someone from Anglia Television, they wanted to speak to you. Oh, can I ring from here? Yeah, yeah, right. And he was very keen on the airbrush style for a programme he was developing, and would I come and see them? So I shot straight off up to Norwich. And, well, the rest is history, because they were developing Nightmare. And he said, we've no budget, and we need all these paintings done, or, or some, for the pilot. And I agreed to do, I think, two or three rooms with acetate overlays to change them a bit. And I think he paid me for one, basically, but pretty, pretty tight. Throne of Fire, Jim Bagley, who would have been here today if it wasn't for the railways, he actually wrote the software for it. So that, that's another Melbourne house. This was one of the two compilation ones I was asked to do for the cause. This, the first one was Soft Aid, which was for the, you know, a contemporary with Band Aid. It was for the Ethiopian famine. This one was for the Prince's Trust drug rehabilitation and was very close to my heart because my best friend at that time died of injecting um, broken down barbiturates straight into his veins. And uh, yeah, he, he just choked on his vomit and died. But it's important to me because that's, these are chasing the dragon, if you like, and he's trying to break clear. So it's that struggle. So it was important to me that at the time. That's the, um, the Soft Aid compilation. And Smith didn't, said they wouldn't have it with that cover. And the, the people who contributed to the compilation got together and said, well, we're not supplying you with products until you do. So they backed down and said they would. But I thought, how do you, how do you portray Ethiopian famine? You can't put jolliness on, or aren't these games great? Uh, you'll enjoy playing them. Their own best spokespeople. So I, to me, it said what I wanted it to say. My wife's favourite one that I did. Again, it had glass in there, but yeah, I enjoyed the... Uh, you can't see it too well in this reproduction, but on the original, the airbrushing worked quite well on it. That's Mike Gunner, which was one of many covers I was given by Firebird. You know, I'd go up and they'd say, look, we've got these three or four to do, and I'd take them away and get on with them. Suited me very, very well. That's um, Friday the 13th. And that's the cottage we lived in, in Wales, up, up on a mountain. It's exactly that. There's, you know, lean to. There's a, there was a shed out here where I used to go out and airbrush. If it was raining, I'd have the board face down, run out, put it up, and put the mask on, and spray. But that, that was quite good fun. That's more of that. That's a sort of silent running kind of game. I, I did that one from Mastertronic. One, I did a couple of Tetris ones. That's, um, that's for Grand Slam Entertainment, who went bust, owing me quite a bit of money. Lovely people. And that's the MD and what I thought about him. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he was really overweight as well, so the Chubby Gristle title was made of bacon, eggs and sausages. <laughs> you get, and that's, that's the car I had at the time. A Daihatsu 4-track described in the press as uh, having all the aerodynamics of a filing cabinet. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's um, one of, another F-16 game. I remember I had my portfolio outside Argus Press Software, Regent Street, right outside Liberties, and I saw my old head of department just happened to be going along there. I showed him and he said, my God, you should have got a first. Well, you know, I, I like drugs and drinking when I was at college. So. <laughs> I did the best I could. That's uh, Ivan Ironman's off-road racer. I got the reference to that. I built the model with the giant wheels. And I found, um, is it an L200, one of those Hilux. It was a blue one in a farmer's field. So I photographed that and worked from that. Um, a lot of airbrush in it, a lot of spatter. And all this was done with gouache paint just to vary the textures a bit. That's Continental Circus. Is it Shinto's Revenge, River Raid? 
yeah, a lot, these are a lot of motor tool people. These are a lot of the budget ones that I got to do. Uh, magazine covers, I enjoyed quite a lot of those. I had good relationships with the people. Speaks for itself, really, you know what that is. That was um, getting even more professional with that one. I did that for computer and video games. It had 3D glasses on it because they had 3D printed content inside. And uh, I sold that again as uh, a book jacket and then twice as budget game covers. So <laughs> I got four fees for that. <laughs> well, you know, you, you've got a mortgage to pay and you've got high purchase on a car. You know, you, you have to do these things. <laughs> and kids to feed. I've got the uh, original sketch of that over in my folder if you want to look a bit later on. But they wanted something populace related. So that's what they got. This one, I enjoyed doing that one. I've not been to Acorn User before. And they, they showed me a letter from the distributor. And it said their edition with that cover on sold twice any other edition they had. And so I never got asked to work again for them. <laughs> <laughs> You just have to move on and deal with it. It happens all the time. That was another CMVG cover. That one was just... Someone bought that off me fairly recently, the original. Jigsaw pieces in clouds. Yeah, must have had a reason for it. Um, now, on to book jackets. I did loads of those. Melbourne House, Interface Publication, Ad Addison Wesley. I think all of them, that was my favourite. It's called your your micro at work, and there's big space for the title and so on. But I just imagine pulling up outside work in that, working in the chip. That was another one that multi-sold. That was on Game Covers, Micro Mouse, I think was one. But that started life as a book jacket. We had a pet rat called Rosie. It was quite like that one. I, I didn't mind too much getting stuck in all that tedium, all these letters to do. Yeah. <laughs> Highlights to do, logos to get right. But paid the bills. These are adventure gaming. This is for Tim Hartnell, who's quite a big name in the day, in the 80s. And it was adventure gaming on your whatever machine. There's a little character there on a camel coming along not knowing what's waiting for him. I quite like the idea. And the same theme here, exactly. The guy in the river on his boat. And he's going to encounter that. So it's, yeah, it's all good fun. These are book jacket covers for Transworld Corgi. A lady called Diane Duane. She was co-writer of some of the Star Trek um, episodes. That's high wizardry, deep wizardry, and something else wizardry. <laughs> she was preempting Harry Potter by a big time, you know, and somehow Ronan came in and took her over and she just disappeared. I think she was first, though. These are the nightmare books. You know, the circular novels, Dave Morris and I think Tim was involved as well, wasn't he? Yeah. And also, there you are, Philippa Dickinson, the person I was dealing with there, good friend with Tim Child. And all the notes and so on. And that had to be faxed for approval. That's what it turns out. So maybe they didn't want that. Can't think. So that, the important thing is, is develop the roughs, you know, get an idea of what you're going to give them. And so they get an idea of what they're going to get. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be messing around with something that's finished like that, having to change things, because it's gone past a committee of people who want to have their input. I always like to deal with just one person to make a decision. So that, that kind of worked. That's really done the rounds, that helmet icon. It's pretty well everything Nightmare related seems to have carried it at one time or other. These are roughs for the Nightmare board game. So, you know, they really go through the houses. There's a lot of ripping and tearing. There's a big rip in that, all stuck together with tape. 
that they were really working drawings. They had to go back and forth and people had comments to make. In the book there's a, that I've done on Nightmare, it's a load of sequences of uh, how it's developed into what it became, which is the finished cover. Jason's very fond of that one. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, shots from the set. That's Ros Inglis, that's the floor manager, that's Hugo Meyer, who played Trey Guard. And oh, I've actually cut it out at the top. He's laughing because they've realised that the set they've got on the background with the cherubs, he's got a little willy. <laughs> <laughs> and go, and he, they've just realised that that's what happened when I took that shot. And there's, there's the gallery. This was commissioned from Jean Pere, who's the French special effects cinema expert. I mean, he, he won awards for it. But that is um, produced so that they could match exactly a camera 10 feet up, angled down 10 degrees with a certain focal length and aperture on, or, or type of lens that would match exactly the studio they were going to shoot this in. Everybody had to believe it though. The people who were setting up the props, the guy who did the illustrations, very importantly that, because their objects were, were going to be placed on these squares and they were basically built around meter cubes of blue. They put two together or stacked them on top of each other and they had to really match. So I had to extrapolate to corners using the perspective to get exactly where those boxes should be. And hence it would all work. It would come out at the end of the day, the perspective was there, the figures were actually walking on ground uh, that was convincing. But they added to that, they put really strong spotlights onto the character, the dungeoneer, so, and would burn out all the background uh, blue, except for they would keep that shadow. And that shadow anchored them to the floor. <coughs> which is highly important, you know, it's going to be convincing. And when I first saw that, first, first time they entered the dungeon, I saw it on TV, I couldn't believe it. I thought that, that artwork, they're in it, you know, it, it was, I was thrilled to bits with that. That was um, probably, probably one of my favourite ones, which was the Serpent Room. These are blocks that actually coincide exactly with where they need to put them on the studio floor. Um, there's a sort of rough little sketch of uh, Lilith as if she'd be sat there. I, I quite prefer my walkway as well, but they, they did CG in the end, it was pretty crude. <laughs> <laughs> and there she is, sat on the blocks. Yeah, it's the same scene, but they just, they can kill all the blue, keep that shadow. So, yeah, they, they would work on that to, to make it look more convincing. And there it is again, she's lounging, and that's the uh, CG causeway. Oh, that's it, finished. Thank you. I, I should have put a finale slide on or something. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. No, no, I didn't. The, the skull falling apart and the time clock in the corner, you mean? Or, or any well, animal? A few of them had like bits of move. I just wondered if you did like keyframing for that or anything to help them. No. That was all just CG. No. I know if you looked at the stomach room over that red one, I, I got, I, I'd gone to bed because I, I was working horrific hours. Yeah. I mean, to, to get the job done, I, I, mean, I was phoned by the producer, Sally Freeman. She was pretty well in tears saying, we're shooting the first episode in three weeks and I've got no paintings yet. I haven't got a program. She's so upset. So I set my alarm for six in the morning and worked till 2 a.m. It was strict, day by day, every day. Did that for three weeks. I had to get the painting done. The next one masked and drawn and masked ready for the next day. So I go to bed at two, I get four hours sleep and then back at it. But yeah, I was on fire, I was living on adrenaline. It was just, <laughs> it was so exciting. So it didn't really worry me much. Mm. Well, question, um, your work is quite prolific. You've actually had millions of copies of your, your artwork out there. Yeah. After all this time, 
how do you feel when you see your artwork? Maybe if you see it on a cassette somewhere here, or how, how, what does it mean to you after all this time when your work has been appreciated by it? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I do put on a bit of a smile and say, ah, it's mine. <laughs> or somebody posts an article on Facebook or something. And, ah, yeah, I did that one. I, I, I do own up to it as well. I, know, I do get involved. <laughs> yeah, I, I do appreciate it. I really do. I mean, I'd, with that Smith scrapbook cover, I'd go into Smith's in Churchill Square, Brighton, and I'd go through all the different, because I had about six people do them at the time, and I'd put all mine on the top. <laughs> and I'd go along the shelves of games, you know, and if, if, if there was some face on, some edge on, I'd, that, that can go edge on. <laughs> is there something that actually you look back on and go, oh my God, what the hell was I thinking when I did that? Is there something that you... Yeah, Black Thunder for Quicksilver. <laughs> Mark, I was, uh, I was talking to him about four o'clock in the afternoon and he said, oh, I'm in real <laughs> if I don't have this finished artwork by the morning. And I did it. I did it. I got, it wasn't good. <laughs> but, you know, he got his job and he saved his neck. He was in real trouble, apparently. Either that or the, his pressure technique worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is um, computer game illustration seasonal? Is there like a pre-Christmas rush? Or uh, wasn't such a big no, well, in, in those days, people were just flying by the seat of their parents. Everyone was loving what they were doing. It was all tongue-in-cheek, good fun. Uh, I think it would happen pretty well any time. I didn't notice anything particularly seasonal. They would have Christmas releases, of course, yeah. and they would probably peak slightly before school holidays. I, I'm not really something I noticed, to be yeah. honest. You said in those days, you were having tiny dreams, good fun. Did that attitude change? Yeah, so, yeah, it did. Once the big corporations moved in, and it, it was international, a huge, huge industry, and, and they all took over and moved in. Of course, they would. You know, it's big bucks. But it was, uh, it was much more honest and sincere, I think, and passionate in the early days, which is why we're all here. <laughs> I had a quick one. Did you ever turn down any commissions for a game because you didn't like the game or the subject matter? Or? Don't think I did, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I didn't even turn them down because I hadn't got time to do it. I just had to find the time. It often meant working late nights and that sort of thing, or you know, weekends, what are they? You know, don't, didn't seem to matter much. I was just really enjoying what I was doing. Because it was, you know, when you give up everything to follow your dream, you've got to really live that dream. And you've got to keep hold of it with both hands as tight as you can and keep going with it. And that sort of kind of paid off, I suppose. It worked out really in the end. And sorry, I've got another one. So you said you had kids. Did they think it was cool you were doing computer game art, or were they just like, oh, it's embarrassing? I think my more daughter did, but she never let on to me. <laughs> yeah, oh, my dad did nightmare, you know. Oh, really? You know, probably that happened. <laughs> but she never did say much to me. But I, she, she has done recently. She posted something on Facebook, and I thought, oh, it brought a tear to my eyes. She was... Yeah. Yeah, I, I contacted Nightmare Live because uh, I noticed on their Kickstarter that they were giving away T-shirts with that helmet icon on. So I got in touch with them and I said, I'm so pleased you like my artwork so much that you're putting on T-shirts and giving it away. <laughs> and, uh, oh, sh sorry. I said, that's OK. Use it. It should go everywhere you can because it's the nightmare image now, isn't it? it it's what's associated with it and that helps everybody. So... That was okay. I wasn't going to take a little fee for that, really. No. Do any companies stipulate that they keep the artwork? Even you've yeah, Stephen Hall at you. Stephen Hall at Grand Slam. Yeah, you know, he wouldn't give one back. He said they're mine. I bought them. Uh, um, others that retain them, I, I went round to Virgin Games, and there's Frank Herman. He's, he was a big name at the time. He's dead now. He was going through a skip pulling artworks that had been thrown into it. Uh, some of them were mine, some were Steiner Lewins, and he said, no, I'm keeping those because I, there's Hackney Market, I can go down there and sell them. <laughs> <laughs> not mine, you're not. So I took all of mine back, which um, most of them were in the plan chest inside that building, but I had them all back. 
they weren't going to get away with that. Well, I've, I've, done, I've done some commissions digitally and I've got to say it's a, a lot less of a pain in the ass than doing uh, masking. Yeah, the drawing I like, you know, I can do that, I'll, I'll scan it, put it on the computer and work on it. But all that mask cutting, you know, you've got to then peel it off, do the reverse for the other part, you know, where it's just clicks of buttons, isn't it, in photo uh, Photoshop. So you embraced it rather than... Yeah, I think so, yeah. You know, I remember going to HTV, showing them a perfectly gradated blue sky. Just that, that's all it was. And they said, uh, come upstairs a minute. This is called a Quantel paint box. It's half a million quid's worth. What colour would you like at the top, in the middle? Go, Just stipulate. You think. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really, really good lesson. But one I had to learn, you know, it's, uh, it was brought home to me in no uncertain manner. <laughs> That was HTV in Cardiff. Do you um, take your techniques and have to rediscover how to do it? Or is that not so ideas to kind of transfer? No, it's easy enough to do spatter and texture. You can throw paint, you know, you can do... You can do no, I, I just think there's a way to do it. And Photoshop offers usually about half a dozen different ways to do the same thing. So, you know, that was okay. Oh, yeah, you yeah, and go back. Or the one I did recently, which is version 26, and I've got all the ones before filling my hard drive. And I've just got an eight terabyte hard drive delivered today so I can actually stack them because I'm scared stiff of deleting them. And, and one of them's on a drive so full it takes ages to get anything off it. So I think... <laughs> 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 so That's... Sorry, did you still do any, like... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm working one now at the moment for a um, guy in Austria. So it, it's a very retro subject. It's, it's a, a, a zombie bursting out of a graveyard, a gravestone, grabbing a joystick, you know, of, of the Kempston variety with the red buttons. Did you, did you make mistakes or did you have happy accidents? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, you, you, you do make mistakes. I mean, there, there was one, I was so tired, I fell asleep in the paintbrush with white paint and it dropped down the painting. I went, oh, so uh, I got a circle template sheet, masked off all but one, and just went, sss, sss, little stars and planets, innit? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you just have to wing it every which way. <laughs> Sorry again, just leave it. Did you ever sneak any little Easter eggs into your artwork? Yeah, yeah, often. Anything rude? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I should have done with that uh, chubby gristle one, though, mine. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Well, funny. Hello, my name's Jason Carl, and I was a Dungeoneer on the second series of Nightmare, which was in 1988. I had seen the uh, first series of Nightmare in 1987 as a kid, fallen in love with it, loved fantasy adventure gaming, loved fantasy uh, choose-your-own-adventure books, role-playing, all of that kind of stuff. Nightmare was totally up my street, and so when ITV uh, broadcast an advertisement for contestants for the next series, I applied, and we were lucky enough to get invited to an audition, and myself and three friends were picked unbelievably, uh, to go on the show. And it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me, uh, to be in a TV studio for a week and a half it took to film the show. And uh, we, we won, which was very unusual. And we were the second team to win Nightmare. And I think only eight teams ever won in the entire history of Nightmare. And it was uh, fun, exciting, scary, challenging. Um, and, and just an amazing experience which led me into my career which I've had since in television. I was one of the nerdy dweebs at school so I didn't have many friends. Um, so the friends that I did have were nerdy dweebs like me, I hope they won't mind me saying that. So um, we, we were the, the, the sort of unusual kids that were a bit quiet and a bit peculiar. So naturally the three of them said well I'd like to do that as well. I led it, I sort of maneuvered them into it and uh, there's two girls myself and, and another guy, and uh, I was the Dungeoneer, 
And uh, when we got to the studio, Tim, the producer, when we met him, said, well, you know, I choose who's the Dungeoneer. And we said, well, you know, Jason's already decided it's him. And Tim was like, well, I'm going to decide. Anyway, Tim let me be the Dungeoneer, so it was fine. Did we come close to dying in Nightmare? Probably. I mean, everybody does. Um, it's, it's not a black and white game, so it's not a, as clear cut as it might appear to be on television. So the producer is assessing how you're doing and making decisions what happens to you next. It's not a clear cut black and white. So things like challenges of puzzles, answering riddles, casting spells, interacting with characters, how good you are at those things depends how long you stay in the program. If you're good entertainment and you're making good television because you're being interactive, you're speaking, you're being animated, you might be being funny, both as the Dungeoneer and more so as the advisors, because of course you see their faces all the time, then you're more likely to sort of carry on. If, if you're very boring, I suspect that maybe a few deaths occurred because the contestants weren't perhaps up to par rather than perhaps what the contestants did in the game. So this is one of two replica helmets of the, the Helmet of Justice. It's not the one from the original show. Uh, why not? Well, because the original helmets, there were several made, and they were actually made on a bicycle helmet for a child out of paper mache and foam because they had to be light. If they were heavy, you know, this had to go on a child's head for a potentially long time, so it couldn't be heavy, so they were very light. And of course, as you can imagine, over the decades that have passed since, paper mache and foam doesn't last. It's sort of degrades somewhat. I believe one helmet does still exist from those times, um, which is in the possession of the nightmare.com website. This one is one of two replicas. So when Nightmare Live uh, started, they used a paper mache helmet for the first season. Afterwards, they wanted to use a more sustainable one, so they commissioned a fiberglass one. This one was also made at the same time as a competition prize. And many years afterwards, I managed to track down the person that won the competition and offered to take it off him for some money. And initially he said, no way, it's very important to me. And then a, a month or so afterwards he said, okay. Um, so I acquired it for what I call the Nightmare Archives, which is a project I've been doing for the last 20 years where I've collected ephemera, notes, um, transcripts, uh, all kinds of different paperwork, artworks, items from Nightmare, which I've collected into uh, an archive, which I'll eventually give to the film of television, National Film of Television and Film, so that it's preserved. And that includes a lot of David Rose artwork and all sorts of unusual things that you might not expect. For example, one of the things I recently acquired was the animation cells from the title sequence of Nightmare, which was an animated cartoon. And they're all hand drawn and hand painted. Uh, wonderful to, to collect all of these items. I originally met David because he was crowdfunding for his book, David Rose Art of Nightmare. Um, and I was one of the crowdfunders. So I was like, this is amazing. Somebody, David, who did the art, is doing a book about the history of the show and how he put the dungeon rooms together. So I crowdfunded it, received the book, then made contact, said it's really good. Well, then you've done this. And he said, oh, I'm selling prints now of my nightmare room. So I said, oh, I, I'd be interested in buying those. So I bought the entire collection of prints of all of his nightmare pieces from book covers through dungeon rooms, through rooms that were never used on the show, but that he had painted. And we became friendly because of that. Obviously, I was buying things from him. Of course, he liked me. Um, and then some years afterwards, he sent me a message. It's a funny story, actually, because I work in TV and I was actually presenting a live news program when I got the message. So I was reading the news live on TV and in between when you, they're playing out the reports, I had my phone. It was on silent, but I had it in my pocket and I got a message from David Rose saying, I've decided to sell all my original Nightmare Dungeon artwork and you're the first person I'm coming to. Would you like to buy them? And I'm like, God, yes, definitely. So I like quickly answer the message straight back on television, uh, which is quite strange. I remember it because that's how it's happened. So um, over a period of time, I uh, managed to acquire all of the Nightmare Dungeon art that he had left. He had sold a few pieces prior to that. And all of the uh, preparatory work, so the rough sketches, what the rooms might have looked like before they were final decisions made. So I've got all of that material, which at some point I'm gonna put online and share with everybody. My husband thinks I'm crazy because, you know, I am the age I am, we shall not say, and yet I'm still interested in what is essentially a children's TV show from the late 80s and 90s. But because Nightmare had such a fundamental effect on me when I was 11 on the show, 
um, working in that studio, making the programme, I fell in love with everything about television. And it's because of that that I went to art school and trained as an actor, and now I'm a creative director. And so it had a huge effect on my life. And because of that, I think that's why I'm still in love with it. And I wanted to somehow try and preserve as much as possible what is available and what people have from the show in this archive to put into this museum at the end, whenever I'm no longer here or I choose to give it away. Um, because Not because I particularly love it, although I do, but because it's incredibly important in the general history of television, particularly in the 1980s, and particularly in children's television, not only from its technical pioneering standpoint, but also from its huge success. So that's why um, I love Nightmare Still, and that's uh, why I'm still engaged with David and with Tim, who's the producer, and you never know, Nightmare's not dead, it might return in some way. <laughs>